me also thank uh, Father Philip for uh, organizing this wonderful conference, for bringing uh, us together, um, and for the very hospitable um, uh, Hellenic College of Holy Cross uh, Greek Orthodox School of Theology. It's, it's great for me to be back. It's great to be back among uh, professors that I had, uh, colleagues, and friends. Um, the one thing I would say is that in the Orthodox tradition, you are sitting upon a treasure chest. And that treasure chest is our liturgical tradition. And um, it seems to me that we are sort of like ignoring that liturgy, uh, that, that treasure, that liturgical chest. <coughs> in Greece, we have uh, thousands of liturgical manuscripts in monastic libraries, in national libraries. Um, do we actually study these manuscripts? Do we promote liturgical studies? I think that for us, the challenge for the Orthodox is to actually engage ourselves with the study of our liturgical tradition. And that will give, will help us in uh, formulating answers to the current issues that we're facing today, to the challenges that we're facing today to the questions that were posed by our people, by society, by the world today. So I think um, my motto is, let's go back to liturgy to research and study our liturgical tradition. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the thanks, everything you said, <laughs> um, it's great, it's great to be back. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting, and I don't know if this is the appropriate place to say it, probably it would have been better for cocktails, but it was an observation about Father Taft. And I'm not the only one who's had it. Uh, Father Taft always used to say, I'm not a reformer, I'm an informer. <clears throat> it's my job to inform, and it's the bishop's job to make the changes. But during this conference, he changed his words, and he said, it's the church's job. And I sense in that a slight shift in ecclesiology. <laughs> and, and I think that the ecclesiological issue is one that's very important and needs to be addressed in tandem with the liturgical. Uh, one of the great things about this is people who really believe in liturgical renewal are getting together and we're talking to each other and we're exciting each other again. And sometimes I'm off by myself and I think, what does it matter? You know, it's the same bad liturgy that I see every so often. Uh, I think that's one thing, and I think the other side of it is the technology. And I think people are afraid of criticism from others. And so I think that these are things that we need to think about as we move forward in the project of liturgical renewal. What is the church? How can we get good input? And how can we stand up to um, some people who might object to it rather vocally? Once again, such a pleasure to be here, to return home to our womb, as Father Nick used to call the school in his retreats with us from our students. Thank you, Father Philip, for inviting us and for having us here participate in this conference. And um, once again, this gathering, eminent scholars, brothers and sisters in Christ, has been a reminder that, as we all know, our church is a living body. It's a dynamic, very, very much a live body. And um, we all need motivation, and as the previous two speakers, and as well as Father Taft has been saying to us, just need to focus on what we have and use that to trans transform us, to inspire us, and to motivate us towards living the mystery of God in our lives. So, um, and as I presented, I'm acknowledging theology is there, we just have to look for it. We just have to dig into the deep treasures of our church and uh, use that renew ourselves first, personally, and then inspire them to know for our brothers and sisters around us.
as clergy and as faithful. So thank you once again for this great opportunity to be here. It's such an honor to, to be here with Father Taft and the Roman professors, Father Cleves and Father Villa, and all the other brothers and sisters of Christ. Thank you so much. Somebody else mentioned that the first step in solving the problem is being able to recognize it and talk about it. And that's what I've found reassuring in face of maybe some pessimistic feelings sometimes, reflected maybe in, in my title of this in the boat. I think I can say now, somebody asked me, what's your answer? I didn't really propose an answer. I think uh, we haven't missed the boat, but I think we have to paddle a little harder. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing, just a quick observation, I've, I just happen to have had the occasion to visit Coptic churches a, a, a few times over the space of seven or eight years. And I noticed seven or eight years ago it was an Orientali Bumen conference down in Washington. We went to a big parish in Alexandria. And what struck me is the church had this uh, screen that came down and they projected um, all the texts in English, Arabic, and Coptic. And that was one of the young techie kids whose whole job is to keep up with the computer. Well, fast forward to just uh, this past summer, I was in another Coptic church, and I noticed they had the same thing. There were fewer people. Uh, the first time, there was a whole big choir of young men and boys, and they all had Sticario on. And uh, the first thing that sort of took me aback was even the deacons who Vespers, for instance, they walk around with the gospel, with the incense. He was just in plain street clothes. Uh, the priest was in, in habit, and, and they had uh, the, the camera. I said, well, no, those are things I wouldn't necessarily choose. I wouldn't want to see a big movie screen in the church. Um, I think there's still a role for vestments. But I really gave the, the community credit for really trying to reach out and trying to, you know, they're a, a minority. Um, their homeland is, you know, uh, is seriously threatened. And they're not afraid to branch out and, and do something. Um, so I, I, well, I wouldn't want to imitate everything. I think we can take courage from the fact that um, when we try, we give God space to come in and show us the way. And I think we have to always allow you know, that little crack would, that would be wider, but sometimes it may only be a crack, and that will be enough. So thank you. <clears throat> I express my gratitude to my friend Philip and to everybody. Uh, actually, to be honest, uh, I really feel very satisfied with the liturgy, how it is done today. Uh, it's done, I don't know. What just uh, I wanted, it's 
it's my purpose to show you my paper there. If uh, we really want to do, we have to begin somehow, and how we can begin is renewal. I have one idea, and I am very uh, serious of it. We need just one commission, produce one book, and introduce all the liturgies, like the St. Ephemius, Georgian, 10 century uh, Saint Saviors. They are liturgies of James, Mark, St. Gregory, and all liturgies. We just introduce it to bishops and to laity. And to, introduce, to pass to laity, we have to go and beg the ignorance of monasteries. It is what it is. We can do. We can change the situation the, because the monasteries are today which have the, this authority to lady. If we want that lady agree with us, we need to talk with the women, with mon to monks. It is reality. We can avoid it and just offer what we want. Make one book. Go to bishops. Go to monastery and show what this is liturgy. Please allow them to serve them. And it has theological power. I, in my paper, I have, I, I speak about the power. What is the power? What is the dimension of power? Second thing is, if we want to read <coughs> the phrase aloud, I am a parish priest. I know that people are, they don't like the long liturgy. So, in all the liturgies, you know, if you go, when you read the huge, these prayers, prayers, mystical prayers, we call mystical, that time we did not have so long and repeated and repeated a part of the competitions. So, if you want to read these prayers, we don't need, I think, or reduce the decompetitions and we gain time. And second, my, I'm, I'm Georgian, I like polyphony, but Byzantine music is my favorite. I, I love it. And I, in my 46 years old now, I, I don't have ear, but I began to try to learn this music in my old ages now. Because I believe the music has also power to transfer the word, the meaning to our souls and congregations. Let begin also with music. Share music, stress on music, make schools, because in the United States now it's lack of music. In Georgia also we don't have enough chanters. Because if you hear in Greek style, you need just one chanter professional. In Georgia you need at least four to make one liturgy. So Music is also uh, in my concept. Let try to involve or suggest to make music an analysis or renewal. It is also very powerful. That's all. It is practical. What I, what I see can be done. Now this, what we did here is good, but it is a real remain with us. But if you want to really do something, we need to make steps. Sorry for this. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank all the speakers who came some very far away. This is sort of a dream for, for us when we were first thinking about it. Um, because, first of all, the fact that Father Taft is living so near, we thought that, that would be a good catalyst to bring other people and give them also the opportunity to um, interact. Because I know that the other people that we've invited um, are doing extremely hard work and are extremely able, and I think you all saw this in this conference that the papers given were um, extremely interest, interesting and very diligently done. And I uh, really congratulate them and, and thank them all for coming. And um, some names are more name, are, some of the names are more known, others are less known. But I, I knew some some of the people I know personally, or I've read some of their works, that they're all doing fantastic work, and to bring them all together in one place. For us is a dream come true, and I 
thank you so much for for you coming and letting, letting this be a possibility. And I think it's um, has been a great thing for the people, the people who are participating, also these live streams, so other people who are also able to get a, a little whiff of what this really means of the virtual renewal. That it's not a bad thing, but it's really a good thing. It's really um, re recovering or rediscovering the depth and the, the beauty um, of what we actually had. I know what we have. And um, Father Tav said that this is a great new opportunity, that it's a luxury that we have now, that not all people always did have. Of course, always there was this process of the virtual renewal, which means um, sort of an evolution, sometimes in the right way, sometimes in the wrong way. So it's not renewal when it's in the wrong way. But like Father Tav said also, it's like watching the grass grow. But the first step is something like this. I think this is the first step. Just discussing, and as Father <coughs> Stefano said, um, just putting these things out on the table without doing that, you can't even talk about any kind of the, the, the liturgical renewal or any kind of renewal. That's the very first step. And um, especially in this day and age with the uh, technology we have, these things go a little bit faster, I think, because they can communicate in ways that they weren't communicated in the olden days when they didn't have all this. Like Father Taft also said, people had limited means and communication was not, didn't have the same possibilities that we have today. So I think this is a great thing, and in a sense we're watching liturgical history being made. So, and I thank all of you for coming, but also I want to take this opportunity because I might not have it later to um, thank some other people. First of all, Father Kalibas has, has been helping me all along, and I really appreciate all his, his wisdom and all his advice from his many years of experience. He was dean of the school, he was president, and also, He's my professor, and I really didn't express myself in the very beginning, the first day, because after a few weeks of almost two hours or three hours per night of sleep, I, my brain just stopped, and so I didn't really express what I wanted to express, and I really wanted to um, thank Father Kalibis, um, because he is the person who did expose us to people like Father Taft and all the other great names, and he instilled in us this kind of love of liturgics to, to the point where many of us and people present are the example, um, went on to study more. So he was the first step in this whole process of really showing us because he is truly a charismatic uh, speaker and we truly remember this when we were students here. He was able, he has an enthusiasm and was really able to um, communicate this enthusiasm and this love of beauty of our worship. So I really want to thank you, Father Kalibas, for all that. Thank you, Mario. Uh, <laughs> <I know. laughs> Let me just mention quickly that the session chairs, because I don't want them to be left out, because it's important that also the presence of our school. Um, Dr. Patsavos, first of all, another person that has formed so many priests, I mean, almost all the generations. <coughs> uh, I think you've been teaching here for like 40 years, right? I think Father Father Patsavos, in the 70s. So I don't know if he's present, but Professor Emeritus of Canada Law, he was one of the session chairs, a very good friend of Father Kalibas, and also all of us have learned Canada Law due to um, Dr. Patsavos. Uh, also, Dr. James Skedros teaches church history. Thank you very much for sharing the last session. Um, Dr. Philip Amalakis teaches um, pastoral care. Um, Dr. Timothy Petitsis teaches Christian ethics, and he also was here. And uh, also we have Dr. Menos Okramenos uh, Karanos, who is our new uh, professor of Byzantine music, and it was very appropriate that he was chairing that session last night after Vespers, where it uh, had to do with music, and also he ended with a prayer chanting prayer, and that was very nice. Maybe at the end we could do that again. Um, also, we definitely have to give, a, I think, a big hand of applause to Nikki Stamaros, because it's hard. <laughs> concerned about details, little details in life that make like, things a little bit more pleasant, and that's we want to show a good Greek hospitality to our, our honored guests.
and she was the one who was able to have the eye to see those details, and I really appreciate that. Um, also, I want to mention Mother Nectaria, who is here somewhere, perhaps. She helped me with uh, editing some of the, the, the bios and abstracts, and I want to acknowledge that. Um, also, um, Josh Cole and Peter Iconomo, who are in the technical team here, and they've been here ceaselessly, uh, working very hard and making sure that everything technically has been very perfect, and because of them, this has been broadcast all over the world, basically, and we really appreciate it. Also, I want to say, give a quick thanks to the students that have been helping and serving. Um, maybe I shouldn't say the names because there are too, too many of them. But also the driver, Sarah Jenks, Shahir Sedom, who's um, a new Coptic student here, um, John Boyer, Liela Roblos, Raja Puri, um, they all helped very much. Um, so th thank you all. And I'll just say one thing that um, I think most of the papers gave us this message that um, the only way that the church will renew is a grassroots process in the Orthodox Church. Okay, commissions don't work. I'm sorry about that. Uh, it seems to me. And also, um, sister, sister, um, sister, your paper, your paper also said the same thing. You proved that you know these things go through, you know, these commissions and they're very nice and have big names and, and then somehow they get lost, you know, in, in the shuffle at some point. The only way for this to work is people getting excited like you people, and then it's like by osmosis and it's contagious and slowly, slowly, maybe perhaps like watching the grass grow, but I think there's no other way. And so um, uh, I think that's what I got. Thank you very much for the, another very good point. Um, whatever is older is not necessarily better. That was very nice what St. Augustine said about, you know, we have to get away from our paganism sometimes. And as you see in our papers, we do have sometimes a little bit of dust, pagan dust that we have to kind of like so, thank you very much. Oh, I know you love me. <laughs> <laughs> I have to thank the Mother Williams for giving me this opportunity to come. It's like a homecoming to, to be able to uh, see all the scholars that I've learned in the past years of my literature study. And the most important, being a member of a small Orthodox community in Hong Kong, sometimes we felt very isolated. We felt the problem is so overwhelming. But by this invitation, I feel that I'm, I'm in the big family that really care about us, who care about our survival, our growth on the soil of China. So this, this is one of the examples of um, flow of communication that really make the love flowing into the society and the community of Hong Kong. And I would like to uh, express my gratitude uh, to, this, uh, to the participation of this conference. Okay. All right. A couple of comments and then leave it open. Uh, you're not free, the panel, yet. <laughs> I'm taking it upon myself, Father Philip, uh, to also thank uh, Father Fitzgerald, the Dean, uh, Father President, uh, Father Vienna Fiel, uh, for also helping organize uh, <coughs> this uh, symposium, uh, Father uh, James Katinas. Uh, for also helping provide those resources, uh, the financial resources for the symposium. But the Holy Cross, uh, through the years, has been blessed to hold symposia and conferences, uh, very important ones, and all of them found their way into either the theological review or in a special volume. So we expect and hope that the presenters will also, within a foreseeable future, and Father Philip will be on your back for that, there was a deadline. Uh, to uh, <laughs> present your papers so that they may become part of a, uh, either a, a, a theological review or a special volume. But I think it's very important that that happens, and not only through this wonderful technology that we have, but also the written word so that it remains and has also further so we can send it to our bishops and to other important people so they may be able to also function properly on these issues. <coughs> Liturgy is like a beautiful, treasured instrument. And an instrument, those who love those instruments, they take care of them. They're very careful about how they deal with these instruments. And an instrument can be paid, paid well, 
or it can be played amateurishly. So it's very important for us to be able to play well. But instruments also require to be tuned up every once in a while. So liturgy requires also some tuning up every once in a while. So, now the floor is open to you. Dr. Penelope. If each of you could have something, and Father Taft, I heard you about the grass phone, but what happened as a result of listening to me for two days is I got really impatient. So if you could say what you would want the priest to do and what you would want the laity to do, that you could, by magic, have it have happen in the next month. What is it that you think would be something they could do that would change things and move us ahead? So Every priest is, uh, should be a man magic. of prayer. <laughs> I think uh, taking into consideration 51% of the human population would be appropriate. One's a follow-on from our doctors, is that we've learned a lot about the different stages of renewal that many of us find ourselves in in the different contexts. My question is, if you're in the U.S., you might have had experience of a liturgy already in English, the vernacular, although we might uh, quibble about what kind of English we you're dealing with. We might have been at a liturgy or our liturgical experience, we already have the doors open, in fact, we already hear our prayers, we have frequent communion, we the lady are involved in exchanging the kiss of peace, reading the epistle, and on occasion preaching. So what else? Is that if, if we in fact already have all the, the, the um, problems or answers, quote unquote, to the problems that you may have outlined, is, are we supposed to be now experiencing the eschaton and why aren't we? And, um, <laughs> and my second question is, what in our, um, let me preface this by saying, those things that I just mentioned were, was the experience of my youth. However, and I realize this will be broadcast, but it pains me greatly to realize that that is no longer the experience of my hometown parish. Things have gone, in my opinion, backwards greatly. So what is it, even though we know these things, and even though they might be part of our experience, to prevent us from going backwards? Any good drivers here to answer? Well, for part of the uh, an answer, I really think that uh, maybe sometimes we should uh, follow the example of Dusky. Just do it. <laughs> uh, I think part of the answer lies in why we have great Lent every year. We have to always put our nose to the stone over and over and over again. I know in the monastery, we are expected to keep silence and our, where our cells are, we have signs, so silence. But the prior has to once in a while say, it's getting noisy. <laughs> uh, so it's the same thing. I think we can't rest on the fact that yes, we've accomplished this, we've accomplished that. Uh, I think uh, we have to keep putting our soul into it and then let it speak back as, as the spirit will, let it speak back to us, take time to reflect on it. It's dialogical. And that means we have to listen. We can't be so consumed with our own opinion, our own uh, uh, practice, that we don't listen. And that's the other advantage of a function like this. It makes us stop and listen. I think 
think Sister Vasa, among many other wonderful things she said, at least in my mind, reminded us that even at the Last Supper, everything wasn't perfect, there was a Jews. And that this imperfection is always present with us. We are, after all, human beings, imperfect human beings. Nonetheless, there's also uh, the idea, too, that of the liturgy after the liturgy, which, by the way, was coined by Archbishop Anastasius first. Uh, so that one measure of a good liturgy is how good that liturgy transforms the life of the community and the life of the families of that community. How well is it that we can measure against the kinds of activities that have somehow or other been influenced by and transformed by the liturgical experience, both in the parish and in the lives of our families and in the individual Christians. So that's something that we could be looking at as well. Is there a liturgy, is there justice after? If I may, may continue that, I think that the church renewal is not just a matter of technical details and fixing this bolt and doing that thing. It's not an engine. The engine must run well, that's for sure. But it is effective when we actually are renewed in the liturgy. If we see the liturgy as something functional, we might we'll lose the game. The point of liturgy is our renewal. So I think that should be the criterion. And that should be our goal and target. Okay, I want to say something. <laughs> um, one of the great things about a conference is when it's active and lively. And one of the things that, that happened was during a break, I was talking to Dr. Tsugos here, and I realized liturgy doesn't occur in a vacuum. Liturgy occurs within the church, within the parish community. And, and I realized that we don't talk to one another about the liturgy. We don't reflect as a community on the liturgy. And I think that's, that's one of the things that, that Sister's presentation made me, made me think about, that it really is a consumer. I walk in, I get my liturgy, I walk out. And so maybe one of the things we can do to honor the 51% is actually all of us at some time to sit down and, and reflect on what the liturgy means and share, I'm from Berkeley, we share a lot, and share our feelings. We share feelings a lot in Berkeley. And, and maybe we'll realize that the liturgy is our liturgy, the church's liturgy, the world's liturgy, and not just the priest's liturgy. I'm sorry to all the priests. <laughs> If I could say something, um, I worked at the seminary back in the 80s, and the one thing that I have to say for me as a blue lay person um, is that I was so impressed over the years, and not because he's here. At Father Calibus, I said to someone last week, you know, Father Calibus was dean, he was married to the chapel. There was something, the love had for the group, for the liturgy, just, it, it was almost contagious. Well, at least it, it helped me in my okay, spirit. Let's, thank you very much. <laughs> no, but it, it was true. Your hand up. Thank you, Nikki. <laughs> uh, we talked a lot about language being barrier, and since we're not going to have all the liturgy rewritten immediately, Clearly, from your discussion, it's going to be a long slog to have that, those sorts of improvements. It seems to me the other way to meet the issue of people feeling connected to the liturgy is something that I think we don't have. We don't have adult education. So that once people are no longer Sunday school children, there isn't a way to help those of us who even grew up in the church really know our faith. So what are the mechanisms you want to suggest? Because I think it's not a language that people go to operas that they don't know the language of and they love being there for hours. 
So it's not simply language. It's something else that we're not related to. People go sit in football games in the freezing cold for hours. I don't get it. I don't do that. But they do it because there's some sort of emotional meaning connection to what I would think is pretty insane stuff. But okay, I've editorialized. But what is it? So what I'm getting at is, yes, language is a barrier. But even when we're doing it in English, it doesn't mean that everybody's connecting or still gets what the liturgy is. So what is it that you can help us think about that maybe we can do as laity and clergy in our parishes that could make a difference in making that emotional connection, which has to be aided by the intelligent understanding of what liturgy is? I think. I don't need help. Oh, thank you so much for that, because I was, I was thinking about that myself. And um, I think that we could at least not prevent people from seeing Christ and being reminded of him. Because what we have done uh, throughout the centuries is actually put up all sorts of walls to make it almost impossible for people, even going to communion every Sunday and going to their confession, it's perfectly possible for them not once to think about you know, all of those moments of uh, the salvific work of the triune God and of the revelation of the Son of God and the things listed in an actual prayer. It's not about him, you know, but it is about him. So it's like, we are always like, you know, ramming our brains, like how can we connect people to be attracted to liturgy? That's not like an abstract concept. We're talking about, you know, I mean, people, Christ is calling everybody all the time. He's yesterday and today and forever, you know, the same. We could at least not block him from our children and make it so hard to, dis, you know, discern his face in all of this. And that's what we're doing, I think. We as a church have decided that there are other things that are more important and we have to jump through all these hoops in order to have even some chance of actually being reminded of him and of feeling him amongst us. And we have to believe that he's not gonna bore our children. He's not going, we don't need to somehow make him attractive. But what we have to do is take down all those roadblocks to him because he can't not be attractive and the most beautiful thing that they'll ever see. You know, it's not about this being more fun than a football game. This is, this is Christ, you know, and we're always looking for something else. same context, I think, that uh, in other words, that it's about Jesus Christ and coming to know him and the salvation he brings. Uh, some priests need to be told that it's not about them. If there's one word I don't think we should ever hear during a homily in church is I. You know, some people get up there and they say, you know, as I was driving back from the supermarket on Monday getting a six pack of bud, I began thinking, what you're thinking about is not important. I doesn't belong in any sermon. We talk about who does belong in the sermon. That's Jesus Christ, the saints, the mother of God, the salvation that's brought by the liturgy. It's not about me, it's not about any priest. So let's drop the eye and realize who is the one who is about whom the liturgy is. So as we approach the, the fast here, um, maybe some of you can just share what, what are some things that we personally can bring to liturgy ourselves to, to try to be this change? What, what, are some, what are some things we can do tomorrow? Just if it starts from people, like what can we do as people to, as we go throughout the fast, to interact with others and to, I don't know, make things happen even an inch? I think the first step is tomorrow evening is the forgiveness uh, vespers where we all at least make an attempt to forgive each other. I think that's one very good first step. <laughs> I'm good at coming up with plans 
from people's lives. It's, it's a charisma. It's a gift. Um, um, I have a hard time reading things, especially especially poetry, but sometimes even the newspaper, and I need to read the sentence over and over again to really understand it. And so I think it begins with having the text with you. We're American. And we don't pick up on things we hear as much as things we read. And if we hear and read at the same time, then that helps out a little bit. Um, so I think that it's important to do that. There's so, there are so many images in the liturgy. And if you look at an icon, there are so many details. There's nothing wrong with, with just picking up on what the Holy Spirit is guiding you to and spending a few minutes meditating on that, running that through your head and, and letting it filter down into your heart and then jumping in again when you're done with that to, to, to find the next image. Uh, a third thing, and that's something that I wish people would do with liturgy, and that's share. A lot of times people say, oh, did you see that thing on TV last night? Or, oh, did you hear that? Or did you read that article? And then, especially in the seminary context, you can say, wow, did you pick up on that phrase in, in, the, in the apostica? That was amazing. And, I mean, I tell people this at school, and of course they don't listen to me because no one listens to me, but that's okay. Um, and I'm going, you know, you've got Facebook, you've got Twitter. Why not tweet the line that, that, that touched your heart? Why not take that, that phrase and put it on Facebook and share it with people? I think we, we learn to love football because we're around people who love football. And I know people with small children, and it's like I'm going to start taking them to the baseball game so they can learn it and they can get an appreciation for it. And so, those of us who do have that appreciation, it's our obligation to the body of Christ to, to, to help get others excited. Yes. Oh, thanks so much, as usual, for your insights, Dr. Kalantos. I was thinking, we often sit back and say, what, what can be done, you know? And we don't, like Father Taft said, just do it. And I think that the lay initiative, to just start like a circle of, you know, I don't know, Tuesday nights or maybe Sunday after the, the coffee hour or if you have lunch after the Divine Liturgy, you know, to have everybody prepare it's like a common text that they're reading. It could be like a, you know, Bible reading, but it could also be a text from the liturgy. But sometimes these things sort of die, and I don't want to be anti-clerical. Um, it's just the way it is, that sometimes these things die once the priest says, oh yes, that's a great idea, I'm going to lead this circle. And it makes it like, oh, it's going to be that again, like, you know, we've heard his sermons, and it's not, you know, it's just the way human beings are. And in the modern day world, sometimes, you know, to have that figure of authority and taking over it, it doesn't excite people as much as, I think sometimes priests could just be, say, sure, go ahead and do it, you know, and let them, you know, have your little club, you know, and it could be nice. You could meet at different houses, at people's houses, do this. I remember when we were uh, teenagers, we had this little, uh, you know, we, we would read, you know, some short story by Tolstoy or some book by Dostoevsky, and then we would get together and discuss it, and we felt super, you know, smart and uh, sort of cultured to do some, that sort of thing. But you can, why not do that? Why not? Uh, have somebody, you know, just a lay person from the parish uh, get uh, into this and write everybody an email, listen, we're going to read, I don't know, you know, Shreya's the Eucharist or something. You, you know, you could, you could read anything. You could read the you know, lines of the saints for this week. Did anything jump out at you? You know, you have wonderful English language uh, sources where you could really do your homework. You could it could just be, say, there's a lot of homework to be done for one Orthodox service, you know, because you're going to have the memory of the saint, you have the anamnetic uh, themes of the liturgy of the hours, like you're going to have Vespers tonight, it's going to come together with all sorts of things, and if you look up those things, and a lot of these things are available online, you have things like the prologue by Bishop Nikolai Dmitrievich for every day, you know, if you do your homework about all this and then get together and discuss what what came to your to your mind and what sort of helped you, and then you also listen to the service in a completely different way. None of these things are going to make us perfect Christians. You know, that's not the. It's not a quest for some kind of ecclesial utopia. It's just to get us. We have this period of stagnation where, like, um, 
professor from, from Georgia says, I'm sorry, Kur. Uh, I'm really sorry, I just uh, I forgot your name. Kur. Kur da Kurdanit. Kur yes, yeah, so it was wonderful to hear you to your talk. And he said, no, I forgot what he said. Um, he said that nothing's happening. Like he says, what's happening today? Nothing. So why is nothing happening? What are we waiting? We're waiting for, you know, but, you know, do this on your own. Just do it among uh, the lay people. I think that would just be more exciting. Along that line, I'm wondering if clergy would uh, have a sense of securing themselves to be able from time to time to ask the people about worship. The worship of their parish, what's going on? What do you think? About the worship. What is your, what do you sense? You're coming to church every day. What are some of the problems that you face? I'm afraid sometimes that we are, that we clergy are so afraid and insecure that we don't trust in the wisdom of the people. Uh, I want to say that it is fact of power. You know, you mentioned why it is not going to anything in Georgia. Because if one priest there wants to do something, yeah, in part, or other two priests, they will take opportunity to blame him before other people like And after the bishop will come and throw out this priest. You know, it, 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 it is part of uh, <coughs> power. That's why I tell you it's part of power. In Aristotle, in his poetics, speaks about the Avogi intertitle. It's not intertitle like football, but intertitle. The Greek tragedy, Greek drama, is like intertitle, he said, the Avogi. The people are involved in process by different tools, by different ways. So what uh, it can be done, it be to try to enter die in this way, the people, in them, make good music, chanting, ask them what they want. And it is one way also to involve. I, you told me about the education of people. You know, I read different liturgies. I told you, St. Peter, Mark, other liturgies. If we make each Sunday different liturgies, at least one per year, and if you read it loudly, and with good also melodies, it will be better catechesis. It will be better catechesis. Would we get the better catechesis? Also, I read the book of uh, the top of which is gay like. Uh, now when we repeat and repeat the same liturgy, it became like our part, it like became our meditation. Because we know everything and we are, we are very good and judging it. But uh, still, somehow, sometimes we can change the liturgy by all crude historical ones, which we have in Georgian tradition, we have thousand maybe manuscripts of uh, the Jacob liturgy. We have different uh, sacri sacrificed liturgies. We have liturgy of Peter. We uh, funduris have the liturgy of uh, Mark and Apostles. Let's do it properly with, with appropriate vestment, not post topocratic osmocratic vestments going to do the liturgy of Peter or something like this, but not make the caricature. Just do the liturgies how it was. The scientists have to sit down, edit some text, make it, promote the texts to bishops and leaders, important people. And after just giving the opportunity to the priests, they don't have power. It is a matter of power. They are in very fragile situations. Somebody will get angry. You done. It is time to say the F bomb. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, with the psalmist, uh, we will sing to the Lord as long as we have being. So let us send 
in song. Praise the Lord. Hey, Dr. Caranas, welcome to lead us. I think in uh, the spirit of the conference and uh, the promotion of uh, congregational singing and uh, intelligibility of worship, it's appropriate to sing all together the hymn of our school in English. Say for the Lord your